Hi, my name is Andrew Needles, Director of Marketing and Product Management at Visual Sonics. The webinar you are about to watch is of our Vivo MD, the world's first ultra high frequency imaging system. You'll see lots of exciting new images, applications, some of the features and benefits, as well as updates for some ongoing clinical investigation sites and some future directions for the technology. I really appreciate you taking the time to join in and watch the webinar. I really hope you enjoy it. This is Andrew Needles calling in from Toronto, Ontario in Canada. Thanks everyone for joining today. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Uh, and I'd like to introduce the Vivo MD, which is the world's first clinical ultra high frequency imaging system. I'll be your presenter today and also your moderator. I'm joined here with Kathy Volpe, who's our marketing manager. She'll be assisting me with running today's session. So thanks to Kathy for uh, getting up bright and early with me in Toronto. Uh, to the rest of you around the world, thanks for joining in, uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to join in for today's session. A few notes about the webinar. We will be recording, uh, and it will be made available, so we can provide that to you later on. Um, you may have noticed your lines are muted. We'll keep it this way throughout the duration of this, the session today. Uh, this will just help with the recording, uh, sound quality. And if you do have questions, however, please use the chat window. It's at the right hand uh, of your WebEx screen. Please use that for any questions or technical issues uh, you may encounter. Hopefully there are none. Um, we will answer some questions at the end. So I, I do have a fair number uh, of slides and material to go through, a lot of images actually. So we should be able to, to get through all of that in approximately 50 minutes. I'll try to keep on schedule. Uh, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of questions. So as I mentioned, please use the chat window. Feel free at any time to send us a question while you think of it, and we'll try to address all of those questions uh, as we get towards the end of the presentation. Just a quick note, um, thanks to joining, for joining in today, but please stay tuned. Uh, look at our website for upcoming announcements for future webinars that we will be hosting. Just briefly, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself for any of you that I have not met. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm the Director of Marketing and Product Management here at Visual Sonics. Uh, I come from a background in engineering, electrical engineering from the University of Toronto, and I began my career as a research engineer at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center that is here in Toronto, Ontario. That was in the lab of Stuart Foster, uh, who, who was the founder uh, of Visual Sonics. So there my research focused on high frequency ultrasound. I've been working with the technology for a number of years. Um, from there, I, I gained a lot of experience as a system developer moving over to Visual Sonics. Um, more recently, I've moved into customer facing roles and product management and marketing. So I've seen the technology, worked with this te technology, met a lot of the users, um, and it's a real pleasure to be here today talking about the advent of our new uh, release of a new clinical product. So I do currently oversee all of the Vivo imaging systems. This includes all of our preclinical platforms and now recently uh, our clinical products. One quick disclaimer, a couple disclaimers before we get started. Um, the product I'll be showing you today does have CE approval for the majority of countries in Europe, but I do need to point out that this product does not yet have FDA or Health Canada clearance. Uh, it's currently not for sale in the U.S. or Canada. There will be um, coming information uh, in, in the coming months on the progress uh, of the clearance in these regions, uh, but for now um, we can only claim that we do have clearance in Europe. You'll also see a number of images in this presentation. Many of them, not all, but many of them have come from existing uh, sites that are working under IRB or other ethics approvals. This may be using existing preclinical technology or some pre-market clinical systems. Uh, so do keep that in mind. I'll show you some of the work and where appropriate I will point out any work that is coming from some of these IRB uh, sites. So without further ado, uh, the outline for today. I'd like to take you through a little bit of hist the history of ultra high frequency, at least, at least from the perspective of Visual Sonics. I'll introduce you to the Vivo MD. We'll talk about clinical applications of this new technology and I'll also include side-by-side -side comparisons with some conventional uh, images from conventional ultrasound systems. I'll introduce some ongoing clinical studies, uh, some work that has begun 
I won't um, be able to go into all the details of this. We do have some upcoming uh, webinars, webinars in our series on this topic, but I'll be able to introduce you to some of the initial work that is ongoing. And I'll give you a little bit of the future direction and where we see the technology eventually finding a role, we hope. Uh, I'll start and I'll specifically go into a, a case uh, focusing on spinal cord surgery, a small case study. That's how I'll wrap up. So to begin with the history, I won't go through the entire history of high frequency, but I will start with Visual Sonics for those of you who may not be aware. As I mentioned, the company was founded by Stuart Foster, Dr. Stuart Foster at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre in Toronto. It was founded in 1999. Um, Currently, the, the company has grown to approximately 85 people. This is globally. We are headquartered in Toronto, where I'm located today. And we've become part of a very large organization focused on diagnostic imaging and patient care. So in 2010, Visual Sonics was purchased by Sonosite. Sonosite is a provider of point of care ultrasound systems for the um, critical care emergency medicine uh, markets. This was in 2010, and subsequently Sonosite was purchased by Fujifilm in 2012. So that's why you do see our current name is Fujifilm Visual Sonics, um, and we're very integrated within both the Sonosite and Fujifilm companies. As of today, we are the market leaders in ultra-high frequency ultrasound for preclinical, this is animal research. But what I'd like to share with you today is the advent of taking this technology uh, into now the clinical space, and this is a very exciting development, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to showing you some of the images and data that, that have been collected so far. Before I get started, a few more points about uh, Visual Sonics for those that might be interested. We do have a global customer base, currently within universities and research institutions. We're present in all of the top 50 U.S. hospitals, used also throughout the pharmaceutical industry. We've got approximately 1,400 systems installed worldwide. We also look at our uh, track record in terms of scientific publications, especially in the preclinical space. There's more than 1,200, both preclinical, but also important to note, there are clinical publications, and I'll show you uh, some of those that have been generated over the years taking preclinical technology uh, into, the, into the clinical space. We've also got a strong IP portfolio uh, with approximately 100 plus US and foreign patents. So this is where we begin. Today, with standard clinical ultrasound, we can see well into the body, very deep. Um, there's a number of different uh, companies, research centers, hospitals, everyone is using clinical ultrasound. So what I'd like to share with you today is where Visual Sonics comes in and tries to make a difference. And what, the way we think about it is, with ultra high frequency, you're now seeing 30% more. All of that detail that's within the first three centimeters of the skin line of the body, there's a lot of tissue there, a lot of different structures that can be visualized, but to date there's really been no ultrasound system that has the appropriate resolution to be able to do that. So ultra-high frequency ultrasound gives you that resolution, allows you to see 30% more. What this means is that we can now see human anatomy as we've never seen before. And this is one example in a small infant we can see at lower frequencies, more conventional, this would be perhaps actually the higher range at 15 megahertz. Um, you can see this small vessel. It's very, very, um, very, very um, small, as you can see, and very, very hard to make out in the conventional scan. We now see on the left side of your screen at 70 megahertz what we can start to visualize and what, it, what an impact having this high resolution and high frequency makes in terms of this image. So we always think of some very key parameters, and I won't go into too many technical details in this presentation, but I do want to make this point, which is that when it comes to resolution, it's frequency that matters. So at the highest end, at 70 megahertz, we can see approximately down to 30 microns. 30 microns is if you think of a human hair, which is somewhere between 50 and 100 microns in diameter, 30 microns is extremely tiny. The trade-off, however, is that we see 10 millimeters into the body. If we need to go deeper, and you can see the trend, 
as we go lower in frequency, our resolution uh, goes up, and so, but our depth of penetration goes down. So there's an inherent trade-off between resolution and depth, and pre depth of penetration that is fundamental to any ultrasound system. So what we'll be showing you today are exquisitely high resolution, high frequency images, um, but within the first three to four centimeters of the body. Just to get things going here, I, I pulled up some images that we've collected from over the years. Again, these would all have been from through IRB or, or uh, special approval with older technology, but I just wanted to get people uh, sort of break the ice here and see if people had any ideas. Does anyone have any guesses as to what this image might be of? And if, if you do feel like participating, just use your chat window and type in an answer uh, and see if, if anyone can get this right. We've got someone guessing the spine, which is incorrect, I'm sorry. Well, if anyone had guessed fingerprint, it'd be correct. <laughs> so this is, you can see the very high resolution, the details of these fingerprints right within the skin line. This would have been done, this image would have been done at 50 megahertz uh, center frequency on, a, on an older generation visual sonics machine. I'll keep going here. Here's another um, image. If you focus, really specifically, I'm wondering if anyone knows what any of these small dark structures are. Well, I, I don't see the right answer yet, but I'll, I'll give it to you now. <laughs> this is, these are hair follicles. You can actually see within the skin layer, uh, the, the layers of the skin, the epidermis here, and then these darker spots are actual hair fo follicles that are coming into view. Um, again, with very superficial imaging here with high resolution. Here's another one. Uh, this was taken from a very young patient um, it was approximately a year in age or just under a year, so it's a baby. And someone guessed uh, spine earlier, and this actually would have been correct in this case. You can see uh, here we're looking at the spine um, with the spinal cord and some of the, the dural space here. It's my last one. Again, we're within uh, first four millimeters of the body. This one is a um, it is in, I can tell you, in the head and neck region. And this one's actually a lymph node. So you can see this very, very tiny node that can be visualized quite clearly. You can see the borders, and then you can actually start to see some of the structure uh, inside of this lymph, this lymph node. So those are, as I mentioned, some, some early images that we've collected and really part of the history um, that I wanted to show you. My next slide, I won't go through this uh, line by line. There's a lot of information here, but I really just wanted to make the point that this interest in clinical high-frequency imaging has really been building over the years. Really since about 2008 or 2009, we started to get inquiries about taking our preclinical technology that was used in animal research and applying it in the human. And we, first we thought, well, what would we use it for? Um, and then as we started having discussions with more and more users, we started to get all of these types of um, ideas coming out of the woodwork. So to date, there's been approximately 20 ultra-high frequency systems deployed in clinical settings um, for, for under IRB for in investigational purposes. And you can see really a common trend here uh, in the vascular uh, application area, a lot of focus on, focus on intima media thickening or IMT. You can see that actually is quite prominent throughout all of these different cases and I'll show you some examples of that shortly. Other areas, specifically in urology, um, this is not something Visual Sonics is focused on, but there is a, uh, a partner company called Exact Imaging that is focusing on urology, and if you have more questions about that, I can certainly pass along their information. Um, in the neonatal and pediatric space, um, a lot of work, again, in IMT, and just higher resolution imaging in general for these smaller patients comparing with ultrasound at lower frequencies. And then various other uh, areas, everything from hands and wrists and nerves, hand transplantation, needle visualization, 
AV fistulas, and again, looking at IMT, but in this case, uh, in a drug study as a biomarker uh, for menopausal women. So many different areas, many different applications, and this is what really prompted us to think there has to be something more for this technology. We've been using it preclinically, but how do we take it into the clinical arena? These are some of the earlier publications that, were, again, were done under IRB. This was actually as recent as 2014. Um, this was in the Journal of What's New in, in Regional An Anesthesia, and this, this review article actually shows, again, with an older platform, the Vivo 2100, an image here of a median nerve, um, talking about the ability of using high-frequency ultrasound to visual visualize these nerves, um, uh, the dark, to look at the architecture of the nerve, and also control over the needle tip when doing nerve blocks and other procedures. So again, there was early interest in terms of doing re regional anesthesia. Continuing along those lines, there was a publication, this is actually in 2013, uh, again, looking at neonatal imaging. This was done um, at Seattle Children's Hospital, imaging peripheral vessels, again, prior to surgery, um, in an anesthesia, in, for, for anesthesiology, um, trying to cannulate these very, very small vessels. And this study uh, was really a, a proof of concept and feasibility study that showed that indeed using the high frequency um, really improved the ability to place, um, to do the cannulation into, in this case, in the radial artery. There's more details here, and you can see the publication, which uh, please do. Try to, try to look up this publication if you're interested in finding out more about this particular application. Vascular research has always been a common theme that we've heard from many um, users, potential customers, and in many cases it focuses on looking at peripheral arteries. And why? Well, it's been shown that, again, the intima media thickness, um, really the thickness of that vessel wall and its various layers, uh, especially in the radial artery, correlates very well with cardiovascular risk factors. So patients that have suspected myocardial ischemia, either for diagnostic or prognostic information, um, this is a, me a measure that can be used to ass assess these risk factors. It's also been shown that in the carotid IMT, an increase of 0.1 millimeters, so that's 100 micrometers, correlates or is associated with a 10 to 15% increased risk for myocardial ischemia. Uh, so what that means is that to see these small changes, you absolutely need high resolution in order to be able to see things 100 micrometers or below. I'll show you this on, on this slide here. This was a publication in atherosclerosis in 2012, and you can see the image quality comparison ranging from 8 megahertz through 15, 20, all the way up to 55 megahertz. And you can see how at 55 megahertz you clearly start to see the intima media and adventitia layers of this um, vessel wall compared with 8 megahertz, where the resolution just simply is not adequate in order to visualize that vessel wall structure. This is a, another publication that showed, um, in, in this case, we have three different patients. Patient A is a healthy, healthy patient. Patient B, um, patient B and patient C both went on to experience uh, MI during the follow-up period of this study, and you can see the increased uh, thickness of the IMT in patient B. In patient C, this is just well down the line and, and has actually moved on to full-on plaque formation. Um, but what this means is that from a, a diagnostic point of view, looking at, for example, patient B, this reflects, this measurement, this increase in IMT reflects the systemic atherosclerotic effect that's occurring within this patient. And this was actually shown to correlate with uh, myocardial perfusion syndrograms and angiography. In a prognostic sense, um, suspected myocardial ischemia um, is able to be detected and, was, and again, was correlated well um, with these syndrograms. And there's more details in this publication, but again, this is just some of the, the history and some of the, of the early interest in terms of using vascular imaging and specifically IMT measurements at ultra-high frequency in order to assess cardiovascular risk factors. So that brings us to the present day. I've given you hopefully a, a taste of 
where the technology begin and began and, and some of the, the development that it went through. And as of um, January of 2016, we were able to introduce the VivoMD into the European market with, the, with CE Mark. So what is the VivoMD? It's the highest resolution general purpose ultrasound system on the market today. It has a resolution that goes down to 30 micrometers with frequencies that go up to 70 megahertz. So then this picture, I hope I can illustrate this for you. What we're looking at is a schematic of the human hand in cross section. You can see this tiny little yellow dot here. That's the median nerve. And it literally is approximately the size of a grain of rice. So you can envision how small that is. And here's an ultrasound image taken with the, of the median nerve using Vivo MD with our highest frequency UHF-70 transducer. And you can actually see the, the median nerve. You can see the scale here is, a, is one millimeter. And all of these little circles are actually fascicles within the median nerve. So again, each of these fascicles is approximately one millimeter in diameter. So what we're dealing with, again, is something very, very high resolution, uh, something that we've never seen before under ultrasound. What else is VOMD? It's a system that visualizes tiny anatomy that isn't visible with conventional systems. It's also a customized, customizable touchscreen-based platform that provides improved workflow and reduced examination times. And it's a cutting edge technology that can help us lead to new medical discoveries. And that's really a point that I, I'd like to bring home today is that with this technology, we now have the opportunity to be able to take it into the clinic, work with many people just like yourselves in order to not only uh, image new things, but also make breakthroughs on the clinical front that, uh, and discover things that have never been seen before. And I'll leave you with that, that thought as we go, go forward. And as you, I'll show you lots of different applications or potential applications today. Uh, please put on your thinking caps and, and think about with the work that you do, where else could, could such a technology be applied? And that's really what we're looking for um, with this new platform is to get those ideas and get that understanding so that we can take it into areas that perhaps we have not even thought of yet. One last point I want, I'd like to make about the VivoMD, the ultrasound scale in these UHF images is in millimeters, and I, I underscore that. One of the biggest differences with ultra-high frequency images is they look very different in terms of the scale. Obviously, I, I mentioned it's much higher resolution, but um, the field of view is often much smaller than what people are, are used to look, look, looking at under typical ultrasound. So in that respect, um, you do have to change your, your, your viewpoint when you're looking at these images. You may be missing some of the landmarks that you typically see. And often the, the common trend I've observed is that when people look at the VivoMD images, they think that there are uh, centimeters on the scale when in fact it is millimeters. So do keep that in mind when you're looking at all of the images today. Here is the system. There's a number of different features, and I'll just take you through some of the, the key ones. The system is powered with VivoHD technology. This is a new, newly improved um, speckle reduction and compounding algorithm that has really improved the image overall image quality uh, on this platform and has really made it much more suitable um, for the clinical space. There's a variety of different imaging modes. We've also got a touchscreen panel here, as you can see, which has fully DICOM integrated patient management, image review. It's got a real-time zoom feature that is really, really neat, um, especially for looking at those very, very small structures in real time, uh, and, a, and uh, a variety of different languages that are supported. Uh, it's fully portable system. System screen is a 19-inch LCD, can be folded, makes it easy to transport. USB ports, Ethernet ports, and it is very ergonomic and easy to use. As far as the software, it comes, comes enabled with B mode, M mode, and color Doppler. There are three transducer models available, everything from uh, 22 megahertz up to 70 megahertz. 
it's got all of the regulatory uh, requirements built in. So patient management, power management for FDA um, in terms of the acoustic output. Um, it has DICOM connectivity. So again, this is a very patient-centric machine. It's got all of the, the standard uh, clinical workflows, patient lists, et cetera, uh, and full time DICOM connectivity, as I mentioned. As far as Vivo HD, uh, it, at its core, it's a speckle reduction technology. Um, it also applies spatial compounding, and it really gives you some, some a really a nice improvement in image quality uh, over what you've seen in, in some of the earlier images that I've shown you from our, our previous generation systems. So this is the system and, and the overview of all the various features. Transducers, as I mentioned, three different models. You can see here starting on the, the top, this is the UHF-22, um, which is a bandwidth from 29, sorry, excuse me, 10 to 22 megahertz, uh, ranging down to the, here's the UHF-48 and the UHF-70. Uh, so the UHF-70 is our highest resolution transducer. It has an axial resolution uh, of 30 micrometers. And you can see here um, image depth, as I mentioned earlier, UHF-70, 10 millimeters, and then ranging up, to, if we need to go deeper with the UHF-22, we can see down to almost four centimeters. So these are the three transducers. They're very ergonomic, lightweight, easy to hold, nice, flexible cable. Um, and if anyone's familiar with some of our, our older style transducers, these this technology really is a vast improvement in terms of overall workflow, image quality, depth of penetration, and resolution. So let's get into some of the applications. How can we use the VivoMD? Here's another long list. Um, the different categories I, I'll take you through, and I, I, won't, I won't show you examples of every one of these areas today, but I'd like to give you at least the highlights uh, and get you thinking about some other um, other application, applications where potentially the technology could be used. Um, neonatology and pediatrics, everything from blood vessels, lymph nodes, even some abdominal organs, um, spinal cord and other hips and joints can be visualized. I spoke earlier about vascular, um, primarily radial artery, but also I'll show you examples of, of different veins and valves, IMT assessment, and other blood flow. A variety of different small parts, everything from nerves, thyroids and glands, lymph nodes. I mentioned earlier about hand transplantations, uh, work that's been done there. And also male reproductive is another area that uh, we think would be a very good fit for this technology. Dermatology is another obvious one. Actually looking at the skin, very superficial layers of the skin, uh, melanoma or lipomas, follicle, follicles, bruising, and in some cases looking for foreign bodies, small uh, slivers or, or other uh, sharp objects that may have entered into the, the skin that need to be removed. Uh, ultrasound is a very quick and easy way to visualize those structures. One other area that's come to light more recently is mus musculoskeletal or MSK. Uh, everything from looking at joints and tendons, pulleys, um, the anatomical snuff box, the region, which is the region between the thumb and the index finger, uh, often suffers, uh, suffers some inflammation through repetitive use or stress. Other medial meniscus, carpal tunnel, tars tarsal tunnel, and spines. And the last area, which I'll, I will touch on later on, is the surgical area. Um, we don't currently have any indications for surgical use. But we envision that when you are inside the body, um, depth restrictions become less of an issue, and we think that ultra-high frequency could be a very good fit uh, for that. I'll show you some examples later on uh, looking at spinal cord, but there potentially could be others in neurosurgery, open-heart surgery, or other uh, abdominal surgeries. So I'll start with some comparisons just to give you a sense of uh, the types of images we're seeing. Here's using conventional ultrasound, somewhere between 6 and 15 megahertz is the bandwidth of this transducer. We can see the median nerve. When we visualize under ultra-high frequency at 70 megahertz, again, we can quite clearly see, this is the image I showed you earlier on, um, you can quite clearly see all of these individual fascicles within uh, the median nerve. Again, the scale here is approximately 
uh, from two to three. This is one millimeter, two, two millimeters to three millimeters. So this is our grain of rice, as we say. And if you look at a histo histological section, this is of a peripheral nerve, um, not necessarily the median nerve, but it gives you a sense of, of the structure of the fascicles that we're quite clearly seeing now under ultra-high frequency. This is another example in the radial artery. You can see the artery here at low frequency uh, with conventional ultrasound. Imaging at 70 megahertz again, we can now see really nicely this intimal layer. It's just not visible at, at lower frequencies. What that allows us to do is actually take a snapshot uh, and zoom in right on that, that layer, and that's what I'll show you on this next slide. We can now actually start to draw measurements using the VOMD to assess the intima media thickness and the dimensions of those layers. You can see that the intima layer itself is approximately 70 micrometers or 0.07 millimeters. You can start to uh, measure the total IMT, uh, the media thickness, or the ratios. So we give you all of those different calculations um, that can be used in your research. Here's an example of the lymph node comparing here at low frequency and then at a much higher resolution. Here we're actually at 46 megahertz, so a little bit lower. You can see deeper into the body, but we're still with very nice resolution. You can start to see even within this node different structures uh, that we can't really visualize at the lower frequencies. This is a nice example in the tarsal tunnel. So this is really the it's sort of equivalent of the the carpal tunnel in the wrist, this is actually in the ankle, and this tunnel uh, contains the tibial nerve and also the tibial artery and vein. Here's the artery and the vein. Um, you can see all of these structures now at high frequency with much more detail. Um, we can make out uh, sort of the, the, the area of this tarsal tunnel on lower frequencies, but high frequency just gives us so much more detail, again here at, at 46 megahertz. Oh, one more example here in the Achilles tendon. So again, using conventional ultrasound, but when we go to high frequency, look how the, really the fibrous layers within that tendon start to, to jump out, and you can really visualize the structure much more clearly. You can also start to, to zoom in, and here we have the insertion point. Um, if I highlight in red in the lower image, you can actually now start to see where that insertion, where the, the tendon starts to to, uh, to come in here at this calcineal insertion point. So these are some, some just some nice examples that I hope to, hopefully to calibrate you in terms of what you would see under your conventional ultrasound versus how it look, now looks under high frequency. And hopefully you can appreciate uh, some of the differences in terms of obviously the field of view is much smaller, much more localized, but within that area, much, much higher resolution than you would see under the conventional systems. I'll show you a variety of different examples from the, the different uh, areas that I pointed out earlier. This is a lymph node. Um, this is within a, a pediatric groin region, and again, this is our, our grain of rice as well, a very tiny lymph node that uh, now we're visualizing with, with ultra-high frequency. This is a radial artery in a pediatric two-year-old patient. What's interesting in this image, we're seeing this vessel, it's very clean, very, very thin vessel wall. So in this case, even at ultra-high frequency, here we are at 70 megahertz, still um, just barely making out some of the intima layer at this, at this sort of apex of the vessel here and this curved point. Um, so in this case, we really don't see a lot of IMT just simply because of the fact that the the, uh, the, the patient is so young. We can also look at adults. We can use color flow. This is an adult vein. Uh, we can also see the valve in this vein. And what's interesting, I'll show you on the next slide, is color is we can use color to visualize flow. But at high frequencies, and here's another vein and a, and a bifurcation point. This is actually just taken in the arm. Um, here it's actually very easy to see uh, all of that blood flow um, going through the vein without even using color. You can actually see, because of the high frequency, the scattering of high frequency uh, off of blood is so much higher 
uh, at high frequencies, you can start to see these, these flow patterns very, very clearly. This is another example, um, looking in an arm. This is actually just sort of, if you look at your arm, uh, hold your palm upright, just where the, your elbow makes that, that joint, just under that part of the arm, there's, there's a, vein, a vein there with a valve, and there's a series of different, probably five or six of these different valves that run down your uh, arm between your elbow and your, your wrist. Uh, in this case, you can see the valve closed when the subject actually closes their fist and clenches their fist, the valve closed, and you can see the, the blood squirting through this valve and actually almost like water going over a waterfall eddying underneath uh, the valve itself. This would be a potential point where um, thrombus or other clotting might occur uh, depending on the cardiovascular state of, this, of a patient. This is a, a healthy volunteer in this case. You can see even in this healthy case, you do actually appreciate how that blood um, really does swirl around and circulate. And again, this is something that you just wouldn't see on, on a conventional ultrasound scan. So one more video. This is a similar type of vein, but now we're actually looking within a pinky finger. And you can see this one millimeter diameter vein there is a valve right in the middle, not as much motion on the valve just because simply it's, it's harder to, um, in, the, in the earlier example, you could actually clench your fist and get it to close. Um, but in this case, we can see very, very small, uh, very, very slow blood flow um, that would be hard to visualize under, uh, even with color flow in this case, but you can simply see it with your eyes using the ultra high frequency imaging. You can actually see some of the arteries here underneath, uh, underneath the vein as well. Let's move on to some other examples. This is now looking at dermatology uh, in the epidermis. You can see tissue and fat, um, the muscle itself through here, and then even all the way down to the bone. Um, so this is just a, a nice example of all the different layers that can be visualized using ultra high frequency when looking at the skin. You can also start to look at lesion, lesions. Here we've got a hemangioma uh, in this, this Hemangioma is very, very blood-filled, as we can see when we turn on color, and it's approximately four millimeters in diameter when we use the measurement tool on the system. If we need to see deeper, uh, we indeed can. We can drop down to 22 megahertz. This is in an adult uh, female looking at the thyroid. Um, so here we're seeing down to about three centimeters, and in this, this particular patient, this is sufficient for visualizing um, uh, portion in this particular portion of the, the thyroid. Some pediatric examples. Here we're looking at the gallbladder. Uh, in this eight-month-old patient, you can see um, the lining of the gallbladder here, this nice uh, wall that surrounds the, the gallbladder. We can also start to look at um, some other structures, in this case the spine. This is a very young patient, just a one-month-old and you can see really nicely the structure uh, within the spinal uh, column. So those are some of the uh, really just examples, and uh, hopefully I've been able to, to highlight for you um, the different areas where the VivoMD does have a fit and where we think will have a big impact. Uh, and I've shown you some images that, that highlight all of those, the variety of those different areas. I'd like to share with you now uh, just really an introduction to some clinical studies that are going on. Um, this is just a taste of work that has begun, and we will be following up this up with more information uh, with another webinar uh, in the spring. But I just wanted to, as I say, give you a taste for, for what we are working on and what's um, still to come. We currently have four investigation sites, uh, up, three up and running, and, and a fourth uh, really very, very close to, be, to being started. Um, I'll show you a little bit of the work today from Rotterdam uh, at Erasmus Medical Center. This is actually a project that's just completed. There's now a publication that I'll, I'll share with you. We'll also highlight some work going on in Gothenburg, Sweden at Queen Sylvia Children's Hospital. Um, we've also got some work just starting in, at Hospital Pasteur 2 in Nice, France. Uh, and very shortly, we'll have a system 
up and running at the University of Pisa in Italy. Um, so I'll focus really on the first two um, today, and as I mentioned, there will be more updates coming uh, from all of these a variety of all of these sites um, in the coming months. This is a recent publication um, that came out of the group. This is actually literally, literally from this month, so it's, it's hot off the press. This is a clinical study called the RADAR study, which is, was all about looking at radial artery access. Um, really, one of the main takeaways from this study was that in all cases, um, when, when trying to uh, obtain radial artery access and cannulating the vessel, um, there was always some form of damage that was, was actually surprising to see that. In many cases, it didn't necessarily have any clinical outcome. There was no real side effect, but it just shows that once they actually started using ultra-high frequency, they were able to start to visualize all of these uh, various conditions that were caused as a result of, of puncturing the, the, uh, uh, the artery. So you can see dissection where actually there was a sort of a gap in the, in the vessel wall. There's hematomas, pseudoaneurysm where the blood was leaking out. Uh, lumen compromise, spasms uh, as a result, and also thrombus. So really, the, I think the main takeaway from this study is that without even visualizing um, the, the, the cannulation of the vessel, um, there was, as they say, ubiquitous um, traumatic injuries that occurred, some serious, some not, but ultra-high frequency really gave them the means uh, to be able to visualize any of that trauma that occurred as a result of the access. So lots of details here, but uh, please feel free to check out this publication. Um, I've got the, the reference here uh, down below, and it, it just came out um, this month. Uh, and again, this is from the group in Rotterdam. Some of the work now that's going on in Gothenburg, Sweden. Um, this is with Dr. Frida Danghart. Frida has been um, a user of visual sonics technologies for many years, and a lot of the early publications that I I talked about um, in, sorry, during the, the history section, uh, did come from uh, the lab that Frida was part of under Dr. Lee Ming Gan. And her current work is focused on looking at um, pediatric patients and the prevalence of chronic kidney disease. So one stat here for you is that um, the chronic kidney disease population in the U.S. is increasing and reaching approximately 12%. It's actually one of the most common causes of cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of different side effects uh, as a result of CKD um, that affect and cause cardiovascular disease. So many of these patients begin to exhibit these cardiovascular issues early on in life. Um, and they're often significantly increased because many of these patients are on dialysis. So this is a, a it's a, it's a big issue and it's something that needs to be looked at. And this particular group with Dr. Dr. Danghart is looking at the role of ultra-high frequency to assess these patients, these, these young patients, to be able to monitor um, specifically their IMT and some of their peripheral um, vessels in order to, to make uh, diagnosis and prognosis about their, their long-term cardiovascular fate. This is one, just really a piece of anecdotal evidence that, that came early on that was not expected. This is looking actually in the dorsal pedal artery. You can see these calcifications. They've never, they've always suspected that they were uh, there, but they've never really been able to visualize them properly. This was only with ultra-high frequency that they were able to, de to uh, detect the calcification in this artery. And you can see these bright spots, again, along the vessel wall. So this was a really unexpected, but early finding, um, so Frida and her group are now trying to really digest how to, what to do with this information, how to integrate it into their study. Ultimately, they're interested in imaging the, the radial artery, uh, port, um, the pedal artery, uh, and to look, and, and coronary as well, to look at uh, intimate media thickness. You can see here a cine loop, and then if you take one particular frame, using that measurement tool, there's a variety of different metrics uh, that are generated. So the work that's ongoing, similar to many of the previous publications that I mentioned, is really now with this chronic kidney disease young population to monitor the IMT over time 
uh, and look at its correlation between some of the cardiovascular effects that these patients um, inevitably, many of them will develop. So this, this work is just underway. Um, no, no results yet, um, but more to come. But I just wanted to introduce some of the, the work that has started uh, with the group in Sweden. Another adjunct study that's come out of uh, some of this is related to the thickness of the intima itself. And again, this was a paper, this is all the way back from 2008. Again, this was a study done under IRB. Um, you can see from Frida some work that they, they showed in obese patients that just looking at the intima wall itself and the thickness uh, correlated very well um, with some of the, um, you know, the, these, these obese children had this direct correlation with the intima wall thickness. So interestingly, it was the intima only that, that had a very significant change. Uh, looking at IMT in this case really did not make a significant uh, difference. But as a result, um, there's a future study that's now being planned in Sweden. Um, there was a request from another physician that saw the technology wanted, to, based on the, the paper that had been published previously looking at intima thickness, uh, wants to now look at pediatric patients that are moving into adult care. So as those patients make that transition, they'd like to do a measurement of intima thickness uh, and look at how it will impact their decision on making uh, statin treatment selection. So th this is another really something, as I say, adjunct study that's come out of the work that's going on in Sweden. Um, the point is, in this case, no other system can detect that intima uh, like the vivo MD can. And when, when these other physicians saw it, they, um, they immediately wanted to, to try this, this particular technique. So this is something, again, hopefully we have more, more information to come on this uh, as we go forward. Future directions. Well, specifically, I want to talk about a case study. This is some very new data. This was a proof of concept study, again, done under IRB to assess the feasibility of ultra-high frequency ultrasound specifically for intraoperative spinal cord surgery. So this is a particular patient was a 69-year-old female. There was a hemangioma on the spine with an epidural extension, so it was actually causing spinal cord compression, and that was the main reason for, uh, for the surgery to remove this, uh, this hemangioma. I'll show you some comparisons as well with CT and MRI. This was um, pre-surgery. We can see here what they've done uh, looking under with an angiogram pre-embolization. So they're actually, you can see pre-embolization, how well vascularized using the angiogram this hemangioma is. So this was uh, what they needed to do is to do the embolization to cut off the blood flow. If they did surgery at this point, um, there would have been, this patient may have, have Led to death, there would be so much. Uh, there was so much vasculature here. So they embolize the patient, then they do the angiogram to check. They know now that things are safe, and they begin the surgery. And this is all courtesy of Dr. Victor Yang, um, one of our, our close colleagues at the University of Toronto. These are the pre-op CT. You have to look closely, but in this case, the the tumor has actually invaded the vertebrae itself, and under CT. You can see all of the different vertebrae here. This particular one, uh, which has a different texture to it, is actually, that's part of the, the tumor inv invading the vertebrae. And if you look on the MR, you can actually see it wrapping around. You can see this, this darker structure here. So this is all related to the uh, invasion of this hemangioma into the vertebrae. And it actually, in this case, the surgery is actually aimed at removing a section of the bone. You can actually, this is the fused CT MR, and then post-op, what you see is a lot of the different bone structure that's been removed as a result of the, of the surgery. And you can actually see this, this white, bright white is actually the, the screw that's been placed into the, in, into the spinal cord as a result of the surgery to help structurally keep things together. So this is what they, they see pre and post using the existing technologies. The idea of this pilot study was to take the vivo MD into uh, the, the surgery and see. Given the workflow of this particular study, um, what, what we're looking at here is actually the spinal cord post-surgery. So you can actually see this clear space up here is actually just gel 
above the, the spine. This is where the, some of the bone has been removed. And then here's the spinal cord itself. You can actually start to see different structure, the, the white and gray matter within the, the spinal cord. And you can now see this dural space, which has actually, what Dr. Yang was saying is, really the main point of the ultrasound here was to visualize um, this space returning to normal because as, as a result of the compression, this space was actually squished up against the spinal cord. You can actually see some of the asymmetry in the spinal cord. So I'll play this movie. It, it, it moves a little bit fast, but you'll see, you'll start to see some of these fibrous uh, structures as well, which again are a result of this, this cavity being compressed for, for so many years. So here I'll just see if I can stop it. So you can start to see, you can actually see some of these, uh, again, small fibers. They're not really expected to be there, but they're a side effect of the fact that this, um, the, dura, the dura in this case has been so compressed. There's a good, a good shot there. You can actually see all of these. Um, Dr. Yang said he'd, he'd never seen anything like this before. They do use ultrasound as part of their, their typical surgical workflow, um, but they're really just seeing um, again, not, not these particular layers and no details. So this is, uh, again, very early work, and he's excited to, uh, to move forward and try uh, a much more longer-term study with the technology. This is actually a sagittal view. So I'll just back up. The sagittal view of the same thing. You can see here, here's the, the space above, some of the, the connective tissues, and then this is all, all spinal cord here. And just to give you some perspective, if we go back to the, the T1 MRI, you can see, I mean, there's the spinal cord, and this is the type of resolution that we get um, using ultra-high frequency, and we can do all of this in real time in the surgical suite, um, which is really a, a, a big, big deal for, uh, for Dr. Yang and the work that he's doing. So where do we go from here? Um, as I mentioned earlier on, we want to continue exploring new potential applications. So today I really wanted to give you a taste. This is the first, uh, first time we've done, done anything like this in this form, showcasing the technology. Um, we're very excited now to have it uh, released into Europe and are looking forward to having it, expanding it into other geographies as we go forward. So based on what you've seen, uh, perhaps there's things that may have triggered your imagination to think about where else it could be used. Perhaps you've seen some things that you know um, could work for your applications or your uh, clinical cases today. So we'd like to hear from you if you have uh, more to share on that. I mentioned as well, in the spring, we'll be, we'll be offering another webinar focusing more on the clinical sites with more updates on the ongoing work that's happening there. So I'm excited to hear about the progress uh, on, the, on our next webinar. Um, from our colleagues in Europe that are, are working with the sites. If you are attending ECR, the European Congress of Radiology, uh, this is coming up in a few weeks, beginning of March. This is in Vienna, Austria. We will be there uh, with our colleagues from Fujifilm. Uh, so please do come by and visit us uh, and pleased to talk more with you uh, about your areas of, of clinical practice or research uh, and how our technology may fit with that. For People that are, will be in New York at AIUM, this is the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. Uh, we will be exhibiting there March 17th, 21st. Uh, we'll also have an evening event uh, on the evening, the Saturday evening, uh, so that's the 21st Saturday at, at 5 o'clock. We'll be hosting a, an event there as well, so please come uh, and see us either at the booth or at the event, and there'll be more information coming out about AIUM. VivoMD.com has lots of information. There's lots of images, uh, the brochure. You can check there for regular updates. You can sign up for newsletters or other communications. So I encourage you, please, to visit VivoMD.com. If you have more questions, um, you can certainly, there's a, a small form you can fill out with any questions. We'll be happy to get in, in touch with you. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the technology, we can try to arrange a way uh, to make that happen. Um, so please do check VivoMD.com. Uh, for ongoing and regular updates. Going forward, I'll, we will forward uh, and send everyone a recording of today's webinar. We'll provide that to all of the registrants. And if you have any particular questions for me personally, I'm, I'm happy to share my, this is my email, 
aneedles at visualsonics.com. If there's anything you'd like to ask me about what you've seen today, any of the publications, um, I'd be happy to, to answer any uh, follow-up questions um, that you might have. So that brings us um, almost to the top of the hour. Um, at this point, I would certainly entertain any questions that, that people may have. Um, so if you do have any questions, feel free to um, enter them into the chat window, and, uh, and I'm certainly happy to take a few minutes and answer any questions if you have them now. And can we get one now? Just, we have one question just about um, availability of the technology outside of Europe. Um, we're really not at liberty to, to say exa exact dates because we simply don't know, but I can, I can tell you that um, we are looking at um, you know, filing um, paperwork at FDA and Health Canada very, very soon. From there, there's a review process that has to occur. So, um, you know, typically, we hope that that process is usually with, within a few months, um, but we can certainly uh, update people uh, as we know more. I would encourage you, if you do have any plans um, and you're within the, the U.S. or Canada, um, please contact you, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll certainly take your name um, so that we can follow up when, when we are more at liberty to be able to actually indicate specific dates with you. Um, but as I say, we're, we're definitely within the, um, in the order of months, I would say that's that's a fair fair answer on that. Okay, I see a couple comments. Just uh, people enjoyed the presentation, which is great. I hope that means. Uh, it was a good clarity and, and that uh, people were able to take something away from it. Um, if there's no further questions, you've got all of our contact details. Um, you know, we've also got, um, as I mentioned, the webinar coming up, so please do check out that. Um, we'll have more, more information coming, coming forth. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time. I know it's, um, I know it's, it's always busy for everybody with schedules, uh, but I hope that Everyone was able to learn a little bit more about the Vivo MD. Um, please send us, if you do have any comments uh, about the webinar, we're always looking at, at things we can, can add or, uh, or perhaps do with this form. So always open to suggestions. So you, you do have my email as well. Feel free to email me directly or, or get in contact with us through the website.